some great songs that the band sing in. Who are those two lovely ladies playing the piano? <laughs> Hello, good morning. Good morning.
Good morning. morning. Welcome. It's a great to have Cheryl with us today, Heather's mom, uh, to help us lead worship. Good to have her today. So good to have you. I'm glad you chose this as your place to come and worship the Lord. If you're visiting with us online, welcome to you also. Let's hear God call us to worship in his word. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. And let's join all those words and all those voices and add our own voices uh, to them and praise our creator this morning. Let's stand together. Joyful, joyful, we adore you. worshiping him today. Wesley wrote a, Charles Wesley wrote a hymn many years ago, Oh, for a thousand tongues, and he used um, this verse in Isaiah 35 as an inspiration. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shall shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and the streams in the desert. In other words, all of life is going to praise his name, right? The psalmist said uh, one morning, it must have been in the morning uh, because he was just uh, making himself known to the Lord. He says, good morning, Lord, it's me. It is I whom you have redeemed and my lips will shout for joy. When I sing your praise, when I sing praise to you. Let's, let's add our tongues and our lips to this praise this morning. Oh, for a thousand tongues.
creation in proclaiming your name. Lord, what an honor it is for us to be in your presence, to hear your word, to sense you moving in our hearts and our minds. And we pray that it may be so this morning. Thank you for your goodness to us. In your name we pray. Amen. Listen to this great ministry from the men. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song. Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my side. Descending, bring from above, echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Welcome to church. We're so happy to have you today. If you are new or if you're a guest, please stop by the Connect Desk after service, fill out that Connect card. We would love to meet you, get you connected, and give you a free gift. This Wednesday night is our final Trinity Summer Nights. It's going to be the best one yet. It's Wet and Wild Night. Bring your goggles. We're going to have that foam pit back. We're going to have a water slide, all the fun outside, hot dogs. It's going to be a great night. Invite your neighbors. Sunday, August 14th, our college and career ministry is getting together for a worship and prayer night here at the church in the sanctuary. Get your college students and invite their friends. It's gonna be an awesome night together. Saturday, August 13th, our second Saturday's cleanup crew is gonna be out doing some big work out on our lawns with mulch. The mulch is being delivered. We need all hands on deck. So if you could come out August 13th, you can find out the when and the where of that in your bulletin this morning. Help us out. Speaking of serving, we have lots of spaces left still as we close out summer in our TK Summer Serve uh, opportunity. We could use your help in some of our children's ministry classes this summer. August 14th, two adults are needed in the nursery and one in preschool. And August 21st, we need one in upper preschool. You guys, this is such an easy opportunity to go hang out with the kids on Sunday morning. Go do it. They're so much fun. 
Saturday, August 20th is our next Trinity Food Pantry. If you've not served at Food Pantry yet, this is a great way, a great start to get serving here in our community. Bring the whole family. It's going to be a great morning and they have lots of spots open. So go to our serve tab and sign up now. Then on Sunday, August 21st, it's our next Trinity 101 membership class. Come on out to that class, learn more about who we are, uh, how we function, what we believe. Maybe we're a great fit for you. We would love to have you come to that class. You can sign up at our membership page now. This fall, midweek is coming back and that means Awana is coming back. This ministry is so important to our kids. They get the word of God hidden in their hearts and they love to have fun with those adults. But guess what? They can't do it without you. We need leaders. If you could lead in a small group for Awana this year, please contact Allie. We need you to do that. We can't wait to see what God does in our kids this year. As an act of worship today, we have giving boxes in the gathering space. So as you leave, you can give in those boxes or you can give online or in our app very easily. Thank you so much for doing that. And now we're going to get into our final sermon in our sermon series. You've got questions. Well, good morning. It's good to have you here uh, in person or online. I want to begin with our Old Testament reading for today. Uh, this is in part our scripture reading for the morning. It comes from Psalm 22, verses 1 and 2, and it reads thus, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. So we have, uh, my name is Mark, by the way, if I, if I don't know you, I think I know uh, just about everybody in the room, uh, but I get the privilege of uh, serving as your pastor, and so it's great to be here today. And um, we're in this series, uh, this is our fifth week of five, you've got questions, and we start out by asking some of our college students, what are some of the main issues that you face in your faith? What are some of the struggles? What are some of the challenges that you're running into in your own self and as you're talking with friends? And uh, it turns out the questions that they asked are almost exactly the same questions that people throughout the ages have asked for almost 2,000 years. And so many of us in this room have asked these same sorts of questions. And we come to the fifth and final one today, and this question relates to evil and suffering. Why is there evil and suffering in the world? That was one of the top five questions of our teens. Lee Strobel, several years ago, commissioned a nationwide study, and he just asked this question. If you could ask God only one question, what would you ask? And the number one question that people responded to is the same question. Why is there so much suffering in the world? And I'm sure it was a statistical anomaly, but it turns out that married people were way more likely than single people to ask that question. <laughs> just saying, it's an anomaly. It has nothing to do with reality. Uh, but that was the truth. And it's a big issue. This is an issue that stands in the way of so many who are struggling with the idea of, of God, the God of the Bible. And there's a significant philosophical objection that has been around for centuries, actually, but still has currency. And the philosophical objection is basically this. The Bible says the God of the Bible is uh, all good and all powerful. So if he allows evil and suffering to exist, but he really wants to stop it, but he can't, then he might be all good, but he's not all powerful. And conversely, if he uh, could stop it, but he chooses not to, then he might be all powerful, but he's certainly not all good. But either way, a God cannot exist that's all good and all powerful. Therefore, the God of the Bible doesn't exist. That's the argument. And um, that's a powerful one. Except that philosophers, theologians, for a couple hundred years have said that actually is not nearly as airtight as you think. Lots of uh, arguments have been made to fight that one. Uh, there are lots of rebuttals. And so even atheists, most atheists today, most thinking people have abandoned that line of argument. That's one that we feel, but they've abandoned that argument. It assumes that God can't be big enough to have reasons for allowing the suffering that we just can't fathom. 
because we're not nearly as big as God. It also assumes that just because God hasn't stopped suffering yet, that he's not going to. It's like reading a novel. If you've ever read a novel and you're halfway through and you get angry at the author because he hasn't tied up all the loose ends yet. It makes no sense. The story is not over. In fact, one of the main storylines of the Bible is that God does do something about suffering. That the end of the story is that there is a resolution. But C.S. Lewis, uh, author from the 1950s, 1960s, puts the dagger in a lot of these arguments. As he recounts his own search for God when he was an atheist, here's what he said. My argument against God was that the universe seemed too cruel and unjust. But how had I got the ideas of just and unjust? Of course, I could have given up my idea of justice by saying it was nothing but a private idea of my own. But if I did that, then my argument against God collapsed too. For the argument depended on saying that the world was really unjust, not simply that it didn't happen to please my private fancies. Consequently, atheism turns out to be too simple. In other words, if there's no God and we're just the product of unguided uh, evolutionary forces, then death and survival of the fittest is actually a good thing. (laughs) But where does the idea of even good come from? It's just the natural order of things. In fact, you would say our existence depends on it. So where do we get off saying that suffering is bad? How can we make that value judgment? It actually is the way things ought to be. It's just an opinion. So that's all the philosophy I'm going to give you today. Already some of you are like, oh man, this is an academic exercise. That's it. Because here's the thing. What I've experienced and as I've talked to lots and lots of people, including a friend just recently who who studied apologetics, who studied all these arguments and how to win the arguments, he said most of the arguments against God are not cognitive, they're affective. It's something that we feel. And what my experience has been over the years is that if you have an objection to Christianity based on the problem of evil and suffering, it's usually not starting out as an intellectual argument. Most of the time it's that you've experienced suffering. You're experiencing suffering. You see that on the news. You see it in your own life. And it stinks. I've been pastor now for 17 years, and I have sat with so many of you in this room at a bedside in a hospital as you watched a loved one's life ebb away. And you watched a parent who breathed their last, and it was torturous. I've sat with you if you've cried and lived in anguish at the loss of a spouse, somebody that you have loved and cared for, given your life for, for so many years. I've watched and sat with people in this room as they've mourned the loss of a stillborn child, or mourned a suicide, or lived with physical issues in their own life that just never seem to go away, whether it's hearing you've watched your bodies waste away with cancer. I've seen so much of that in my life, and you've seen it too. And that's why we struggle with suffering, because we've experienced it. We can see it on the news, and it's terrible, but when we experience it in our own lives, and we just ask ourselves, why? When you're in the middle of a marriage, and it just feels like it's disintegrating, why is there so much evil and suffering? You've experienced that. That's the real reason, most of the time, why we think to ourselves, Uh, if God is a God of love and he's all-powerful, why? Why does he let this happen? And we struggle with those things. If you've never asked yourself why the world is so infected with evil and suffering, you will. You will. You'll get there because it will strike you with full force. And it will suck. And I really wish I could stand here in the shoes of God and give you all the answers for the question that we asked so many times, and that question is why. And obviously, I can't do that. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says that on this side of heaven, we only see things dimly. We can't understand things uh, from our finite perspective. That's my paraphrase. But here's what I want to talk about today, because uh, when I look at the Bible, when I read through the Bible and I look at it through the lens of faith, there are some things we can understand about suffering. There's some really significant things that are pretty amazing. Um, Let me give you an analogy. Denise and I, a few years ago, her mom used to own a place up in Manistee. Uh, They've since sold it. 
but we would drive up to Manistee on occasion and spend some time for the weekend there. And uh, one year we were driving up US 31 and we're going up on the west side, you know, it's um, way over here, if you guys aren't familiar with Manistee. And the fog sometimes rolling off Lake Michigan could be unbelievably. And, and so it was so thick one time as we were driving up 31, it was a nighttime, it's kind of rural, there's not many lights around. I literally could not see the white lines on the right-hand side or any sort of center line. You're just kind of driving blind down the road, and you've done that, and it's scary, and you're probably driving too fast. And at some point, I came upon, uh, I came up to a big semi-trailer, and you come up to a big semi-trailer, and it was going slow enough, but you see the outline of the lights, there's lights at the top and the sides, and, and um, they usually have big fog lights, and so I just slowed down, and I was so thankful that I was following this big semi-trailer because it may go off the road for sure, but at the same time, it seemed like uh, this man or woman knew what they were doing, and they're just going down, and you can kind of see a little bit. You're just following along in the lights, even though the fog is super dense. You with me? So evil and suffering and all the stuff that goes on in the world is kind of like the fog, and I want to just give us a few points of light. Sometime through the fog, we don't know the answers, we don't know everything, but there are some things in the Bible that are like those points of light, that are like these, these places that we can go and we can see, well, if this is true and this is true and this is true, I can follow and I can have faith in a God uh, who loves me. And so I want to just share some of those points of light. We have three points of light, and then I want to have us celebrate communion together. Those points of light, when we're asking the questions why, start out with this one. Uh, point of light number one. God is not the creator of evil and suffering. God's not the creator of evil and suffering. The, the question uh, that you so often hear is this. Why didn't God just create a world where suffering and evil didn't exist? And the Bible says, he did. He did create that world. Genesis 1 begins this way in verse 31. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. But if God's not the author of evil and suffering, if God isn't evil and God doesn't want suffering, where did it come from? And the answer that the Bible tells is that God created human beings with free will. God wanted to create us as the pinnacle of his creation in such a way that we would love him voluntarily. And if you create something that you want to love you, but you want it to be voluntary, not like a robot, not like a, a Barbie doll that you pull a string and it says, I love you. That's not love. That's just programmed in. God creates human free will, and God does that at a risk. And when he does that, humans push God away. Humans reject God. That's the very first verses of the Bible, is that human beings reject God, that we walk away from him. And every human being ever since then has done that. And the result of that first sin, which is what the Bible calls it, is the introduction of evil and suffering into this world. And it comes in a couple different forms. One is moral evil, and the second is what you might call natural evil. Moral evil is just the immorality, uh, the suffering that comes because humans, like you and like me, choose to be selfish or arrogant or uncaring or hateful or abusive. Romans 3.23 says everybody, every single person, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, the perfection of God, the beauty of God. Some, have, some people have estimated that up to 95% of the suffering of the world comes as a result of people. It's, it's our own stuff. Think of the war that we're following in the news. Hopefully you still follow that, the war over in Ukraine. Did God cause that war or did the evil act of a dictator of Russia start a war like that? You see untold suffering, people dying. It's crazy. It's terrible. It's caused by humanity. Famine is something that happens around the world at various times. Is it because there's not enough food? No. Again, estimates have said that there is enough food for at least 3,000 calories for every single human being on the earth. It's more of a distribution problem. It's greed. It's different things. It's supply chains disrupted because of wars. Moral evil is one of the biggest categories of the suffering that we experience. It's not because God does it. It's because you and I do stuff that messes with the system. The second kind of evil is often called natural evil, and you can say that's things like earthquakes or tornadoes, hurricanes. Those cause lots of suffering, 
But those two, the Bible says, are the result of sin that entered into the world. As one author explained, when humans told God to shove off, he partially honored our request. Nature begins to revolt. Somehow the earth is cursed. Genetic breakdown and disease happen to us. Pain and death become part of the human experience. Genesis 3.18 describes it as the thorns and the thistles being introduced into the garden. Romans 8.22 says, For we know that up to the present time all of creation groans with pain, like the pain of childbirth. It's like nature itself longs for the redemption that's to come and for things to be set right, because right now it's full of disorder and full of chaos. God does not create evil and suffering. In fact, uh, his heart, I believe, breaks with us in the midst of the evil and suffering and the pain that you and I experience. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is one that you know if you've ever done a Bible quiz before and somebody says, what's the shortest verse in the Bible? You don't have to know the verse. What's the shortest verse? The words. Jesus wept. You know the context of that, right? The context of that verse, Jesus wept, is in John Verse, chapter 11, when Jesus comes to the graveside of his friend Lazarus, and Lazarus is dead, and Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha, Jesus' friends, all three, his friends are sitting there wailing at the graveside because their brother has passed away. And Jesus, even knowing that in a few moments he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead, experiences anguish. And it says that he wept. He wept. In the Greek, as you read through that, the idea is that he weeps, not uncontrollably, but weeps like you and I would weep at the death of somebody that we love. He is torn up inside because he, God in the flesh, has his heart broken at the sight and existence of suffering and death and sickness. He is right there with us. God's not the cause of it. God's heart is actually broken in the midst of that. That's the first point of light that I want to talk to you about. The second one is just this, and I hope that these are helpful for us, is that though suffering isn't good, God uses suffering to accomplish good. Suffering is not good. There's nowhere in the Bible that it says that suffering is good. I don't mean to minimize any suffering, but God uses it so many times to accomplish good. One of the things that he does, I'm going to give you three, things, three ways that he does this. One is that he uses pain to draw people to Christ. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says this, For God sometimes uses sorrow in our lives to help us turn away from sin and seek eternal life. We should never regret his sending it. The philosopher Peter Kreft put it this way, The meaning and purpose of suffering in history is that it leads to repentance. Only after suffering, only after disaster, does Israel and donations and even to individuals turn back to God. Suffering brings repentance. We learn the hard way. And then he quotes C.S. Lewis, who I quoted earlier, who said, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. We know that's true. When things are going really well for us, oftentimes we're tempted to not think about God. We just forget Him. And then when we suffer, we experience heartache and we experience loss and we experience disappointment. And that oftentimes makes us more likely to turn to Him because we realize there's nothing else that we have. Everything else can be taken away. And we're forced to depend on God. When suffering happens, we recognize that somehow that's how God uses those things to attract us toward the greatest joy that we can ever experience, and that's an intimate relationship with Him now and forever. God oftentimes uses pain to do that. Some of you have heard uh, the name Johnny Erickson Tata. Uh, She was a woman who, when she was 17, over 50 years ago, broke her neck as a teenager. She's been paralyzed ever since, but has written book after book and encourage so many different people. Listen to how she describes the pain of that accident and the way God used used it to draw her to God. She said this, and if you, I can't even imagine being in a wheelchair over 50 years and saying these words, 
I would rather be in this wheelchair knowing God than on my feet without Him. Rather be on, in this wheelchair knowing God than on my feet without Him. It took paralysis for her to bring her to God. Sometimes, even though suffering is not good, God uses it for the good purpose of turning people's hearts to Him. A second way that God uses good, uh, uses suffering for good, is He will oftentimes use pain in our lives to sharpen our character, to grow us to be more like Him, to be made more Christ-like, to become more holy. You can use lots of different types of language. Romans 5.3 says this, We also rejoice in our sufferings. Let that sink in for a second. We rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And then James, in a similar way, the brother of Jesus says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Oftentimes, God uses stuff like that to grow us. The problem is we don't ever see the big picture. In 2003, when I was in seminary, I climbed the first 14,000-foot peak uh, that I ever climbed. I've only done two. Um, Out in Colorado, the Rocky Mountains, it's a big deal. I'd never climbed one before. I was kind of intimidated. I had three guys I was going with. And uh, I didn't know what to do, and so I turned to my friend Tom, who went to our church, and I, he had climbed 20 or 30 14ers. And so Tom said, here's what you need, because I'm like, I don't even know what to take. I don't have a backpack. I don't know what to, what to do at all. And see, so here's the deal. So he packed my backpack for me, gave me his backpack. He put at the bottom of it, um, I had two canisters of water. Um, I had a lined rain jacket, a fully lined rain jacket that he stuffed in the bottom. It it was kind of heavy, actually. I was surprised. And then on top of that, he put uh, several cliff bars and an apple and and a sandwich so that we could have that for lunch. And so here we are going up this 14,000 foot peak. Step after step, it just feels like it's straight up the whole time. Five hours. We start out at seven in the morning. As I go up, Longer and longer and longer. I just feel like my legs are getting heavier. At one point, I, I literally was going up steps like this because there's mostly it's steps. You can't fall off. And I'm lifting my leg so I can get one more step. I'm lifting my leg up here like this. I was so heavy. And, and I began to curse my backpack because my backpack, which probably weighed 15 pounds, seemed like it weighed 50 pounds. And as I got closer and closer to the summit, the object of my ire, because it was mid-60s, and it was clear skies, the object of my hatred became that stupid rain slicker that was so useless. And, and Tom used to be my friend, and now he's my greatest enemy. <laughs> because I'm climbing up this thing, and I'm thinking, he was an idiot. Why did he do this? And so we summit about noon, we eat our sandwich, and we're on our way down, and the temperature dropped, which is pretty common when you're climbing in the 14ers. And about 1 o'clock, it started to sprinkle. The mist started to come down, and then it started to pour rain. And you better believe that I ripped that jacket out of my backpack and I put it on. And I was the only one in my foursome that had a jacket like that. And for an hour, this cold rain coming down in 30 degrees was just pelting everybody. And we got to the bottom, and I was dry, and I was warm, and Tom was my friend again, and and these these other three all hated me. Suffering in our lives can be like that rain slicker. We're carrying this thing around, and it just feels like a heavy load, and we can't figure out why God would give that to us. We can't figure out why it's in our life. We can't, it just hurts and it feels heavier and heavier and heavier and more useless and more painful. And it causes us to start doubting why do we ever like trust this God in the first place, the one who puts this in our life. And then all of a sudden, sometime we realize one day, wow, actually, I'm a lot more compassionate than I was before I had the suffering in my life. You've experienced this in different ways. I've experienced this in my own life through the death of my father, through cancer that I had several years ago, through death of different people, through the experience that I share with you 
that I'm a much more compassionate pastor and husband and dad than I was when I started here. Some of you wish I would go further, (laughs) which is fair, but I'm kinder, more patient because of the different things that I've experienced. You've experienced this sort of thing, and then somebody comes into your life, and they are experiencing something very similar to what you went through a year ago or two years ago. Sometimes it's still really raw. Sometimes there's been some healing that's taken place, and all of a sudden you're talking to that person who's experiencing something that's really painful, and they're just wrecked by it, and you're able to just sit with them and cry with them, and not give them all the answers, but just be with them because you've been through something like that before. Because all of a sudden, your character, you didn't even know that it happened. You just didn't, there was no linear line that this happened, and all of a sudden, I'm more kind or more compassionate. It's just this jagged, it's this walk, it's like a crazy way that somehow God uses those things to grow us. You've experienced this, right? Amen? God uses those things. If I were to go back, would I choose to have cancer? Would I choose to have those different things? Probably not, because I didn't know what was going to happen as a result. But we see things from such a limited perspective. I love the words of Elizabeth Elliot. I read her book this week, uh, Suffering is Never for Nothing. And maybe you recognize the name Elizabeth Elliot. Uh, If you don't know her, her husband, her first husband, Jim Elliot, was a missionary to the Aka Indians of Ecuador, and, and they went, uh, there were several of them, five of them all together, he, Nate Saint, and three others, and they went to this people that were known to be pretty violent, and within days, uh, they killed them. The, the, these Indians killed each of the five missionaries. Elizabeth Elliot didn't find out about it for days, was totally distraught, as you can imagine, right? You give your life to Christ, you give your life to sharing the mission of Christ, and all of a sudden, your husband is killed for it. So she did what all of you would do. She traveled there herself and lived there for two years and saw so many of those Indians come to Jesus. And then, um, if you want to know more about that or, or watch a movie about it, Through Gates of Splendor is a great dramatization of that. But 16 years later, she married another man only to watch him die of cancer three years later. She experienced suffering, big time. And here's what she says in this book, Suffering is Never for Nothing. She says, the deepest things that I have learned in my own life have come from the deepest suffering. And out of the deepest waters and the hottest fires have come the deepest things that I know about God. God sometimes uses pain to sharpen our character, to grow us, to make us more like him, to mold us, to refine us. Suffering's not good, but God can use it for good. A third thing that God uses suffering to do good in our life, uh, how he does that is that he can use use suffering to teach us that this world is not our home. This world is not our final home. It's so easy for us when things are going well uh, to just live with the assumption that this life is all there is. And when things are going great, uh, we're tempted to be so attracted to this world that we don't look forward to the next world. When things are really terrible in our life, we get so Focused on this life, we're dis- we despair and we, th- we think there is no life to come. And so suffering oftentimes prompts us to focus on in eternity, to focus on the fact that God has promised us more than just this fleeting existence, that there is a good that will come that's far greater than we can possibly imagine. imagine again, I don't want to minimize the suffering that we go through because it's terrible and it's hard. But I want to point us to a different perspective, that there's more. I want, to, I want you to look at this verse, 2 Corinthians 4. This was written by the Apostle Paul, who, if you know his story, suffered beatings and shipwrecks and stonings and imprisonment and rejection and hunger and thirst and homelessness. All those things were what he experienced, far more than most of us will ever have to endure. And here's what he said. For our light and momentary troubles, our light and momentary troubles. This is the guy uh, who five different times his back was shredded when he was flogged 39 lashes by a whip. It's the guy who three times was beaten to a pulp by rods. He says, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us what? An eternal glory 
that far outweighs them all. He says again in Romans 8, I consider that our present sufferings are not even worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Think of it this way. Imagine that on the first day of 2022, just eight months ago, uh, you had a really, really terrible day. It was terrible. You had a painful root canal at the dentist. No offense to the dentist. You crashed your car. Your stock portfolio took a nosedive. Your spouse got sick. A friend betrays you. Start to finish. It's like the title of the, the children's book, Alexander's, Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. Right? That's your January 1, 2022. And then, for the rest of the year, every other day is just plain terrific. Your friend wins the billion-dollar lottery and gives you $25 million free and clear, no taxes. Some of you already got up and left, right, right there. Uh, your job is going great. You get promoted to your dream job. Time magazine takes your picture and they make you their person of the year. You, you have your first child and, and she's healthy and she's strong. Your marriage is idyllic. Your health is fabulous. You take a three-month-long vacation to Tahiti. That's the rest of your year, right? Then New Year's Day, 2023, somebody asks you, how was your 2022? What would you say? You'd say, it was amazing. It was wonderful. And then you'd think about it for a second and they'd say, well, what about the first day? Wasn't that pretty bad? And you're like, yeah, that was bad. That was pretty terrible. But by comparison, the rest of the year has been unbelievable. 364 great days outweigh that one bad day. It kind of fades away. doesn't mean it wasn't hurtful. So let me pose this scenario to you. Don't you think that it will be the same way in heaven? Again, not to deny the reality of your pain. Each one of us, even this morning, is going through hardship. But what if... And what if it's chronic? And what if it lasts all 72 of your years or 80 of your years or 50, whatever your life turns out to be? And then you, you are in eternity with God. In year number 53,683,212, somebody comes to you and they say, how's it been? <laughs> how's your eternity been? How's your existence been? What would your answer be? Would you focus on the 72 years of hardship? Or would you focus on the 53 million, whatever I said, day, years? Somebody says, how has it been? You're saying, it's wonderful. Words can't describe the joy that I experience. I get up in the morning. I, my body doesn't ache. I had a great night's sleep, and I breathe in the air of heaven, and I smell the smells of trees and flowers that are new every day, and I wake up with a brand new song in my heart that God gave just to me, and I sing it in worship, and I stand around the throne with the masses, and we worship together, and we interact together, and we don't have shame or guilt, and all the things that we experience, it's amazing. That's what we'll experience for eternity. So did the life that you lived on earth and the hardships you experienced and the death that you saw and the person, the loss and the loneliness and the different ways that you experienced, did those things hurt? Absolutely. Are those things normative now? No. Our existence in eternity will be far, 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 millions and millions and millions of times better. It doesn't minimize the pain that we're going through. But I want to change our perspective that God uses those things in our life today to help us to understand that this life that we're experiencing is not our final home. Amen? First Corinthians 2 says, No eye has ever seen, no ear has ever heard, no mind has even conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. God uses our suffering. Even though suffering is not good, he uses it for good. So, so let's review. We're almost done. And then we'll have communion together. Point of light number one, these taillights that we're following through the fog, is that God didn't create evil and suffering. The second one is that even though evil and suffering is not good, God uses it for good in so many different times. We've talked about three different ways. 
The third point of light I want you to keep in mind when suffering is going on in your life is just this, that Jesus promises to be with us in the midst of our suffering. Jesus promises us he will be with us in the midst of our suffering because God's ultimate answer to evil and suffering is not an explanation. It's the incarnation. It's not a why. He doesn't tell us why. He tells us who will be with us in the midst of that. And it's God himself. Jesus Christ, the risen Savior, the one who suffered, the one who was rejected, the one who was lonely, the one who his friends abandoned him, the one who had his hands and feet nailed to a cross, the one who died for you after the sins of every single person of this world were piled on him, that Jesus is alive and he is with you. He promises that he will be with us to the very end of the age. He promises that he is with you in the midst of the trough of despair that you feel. He promises that he will be with you every step of the way, the highs and the lows, the good and the bad. He was with you in the hospital room when your wife or your husband passed away. He was with you in the midst of the deepest despair you've ever experienced. He promises that he will be with us. The words of Psalm 22 that I read at the beginning, maybe you heard those words and you're like, those aren't from Psalms, those are from Jesus on the cross. Because Jesus knew the Psalms. He had so much of the Bible memorized. Psalm 22, verse 1 and 2, when Jesus was nailed on the cross, taking your sin and my sin on himself, He experienced loneliness. He experienced shame. He experienced separation from the God of heaven. And he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish. My God, cry out. I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. He continued on, and there's a great psalm, but verse 17, he says, All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. But here's where he goes with this. In the midst of Jesus' own suffering on the cross, he cries out to God and he says, But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Even Jesus had to recognize that the Father was near him. And he cries out and he acknowledges that, God, you will be there. The Bible says that God is close to the brokenhearted and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. That might be you today. That might have been you last week. It might be you next week. The crushed in spirit. I'm convinced in these taillights that we're following in the midst of the fog of suffering that God did not create evil and suffering. But his heart breaks for us in the midst of that. And that even though suffering is never good, that God oftentimes uses it for good. He will draw people to himself. He grows us in our character. He convinces us that there's more to this life than what we are experiencing at this moment. And all of those things are awesome, but they pale in comparison to the fact that Jesus promises he will be with us here in the midst of our suffering. And if this communion table does nothing else, it's it's a perfect incarnational experience that helps us to understand that Jesus is here. That he is with us. So I want to pray. We're going to hear the men uh, sing another song for us, and then I'm going to ask the elders and deacons while they're singing to come up and and take the elements and move to the different stations so that they can serve us as we have communion together. But Father, I just do thank you. Uh, We're confused. It is really hard when we're going through really hard trials, when we're going through challenges, when we're going through loss and loneliness and grief. It's hard for us. It's like we're driving down the road and the fog is so thick that we can't see and it seems hopeless. and It seems like we're about to go off into the ditch or off a cliff at any moment. And yet in the midst of the fog, you somehow come before us and give us these points of light. You teach us 
that, that you are the one who created us and loves us and who made us and who wants to be with us. Your heart breaks with us in the midst of our own pain. You're the one who comes and, and uses those things in our life, the chaos and the disorder and the confusion and the pain and the suffering. Somehow, some way, you're able, because you are so big and you're so outside of us, and you have such complete command of all of the universe that somehow you use those things to grow us and to stretch us and to draw us near to you and to teach us that there is more and that more is you. And so thank you. We can have joy in the midst of those sufferings. Not because of the suffering, but because of what you do in those. And then we can come to a table like this today and know that you are with us. That you promise that you will be here. You'll minister to our hearts. You'll rub salve on our wounds. And you promise that you will be with us not just today, but the next hour and the next hour as that pain continues and that you will be with us forever and ever and ever. And that what we'll experience with you in eternity will make the pains and light and momentary things that we experience today pale in comparison. So all those things, Father, we thank you for as we come to this table, as we listen to this great song. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. Let us break bread together. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and he gave thanks and he said, this is my body given for you. Whenever you eat this bread, do this in remembrance of me. The same way after the supper, he took the cup. He said, this cup is my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. And so whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, do this in remembrance of me. So this meal is for anybody who is a follower of Jesus. You don't have to be part of our church. You don't have to be a member here. You can be here for the first time. If you're a lover of Jesus, 
and are following him, then come and take this meal together. We've got three different stations set up, but you can come to any of them as the music plays in a moment. Take one of the pieces of bread, and one of the elders or deacons will bless you, and then take one of the cups of juice, and then find your way back to your seat. Um, Eat the bread, drink the cup on your own, and then we'll sing Amazing Grace when we're all done. So Father, we, take, we thank you today that you take these everyday elements of bread and juice and you set them aside for your holy and consecrated use today. You are here in our midst. You want to bring healing and a balm to our soul. And you are present with us. And so Father, we thank you for that gift that we can experience now and forevermore. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come and let's break bread together. to um, take advantage of the fact that we'll have some of the elders and deacons available for prayer. They're just going to stay standing at the stations there on the sides. Uh, Come, if you're experiencing uh, whatever it is, and you'd love to have somebody pray for you and pray over you, then just take advantage of that. Uh, You can do that while we're singing Amazing Grace. You can do it afterward. We're here for you. We just want to bless you. But let's stand and sing this great, great song. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound.
when we've been there for 10,000 years, 10 million years, 10 gazillion years. Right? Let me leave you with this blessing. It comes from 1 Peter, a benediction. If you want to raise your hands, hear these words. It says, And the God of all grace, who called you to His eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will Himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. So to Him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Amen.